Hello, everyone, and welcome again to World's True Crime. I'm Brad, and with me, as always, is my beautiful fiance, Denise. Hello, everyone. So now, on our trip around the world, we're going to be heading to Colombia, South America. Just next door to the last one, Venezuela. So by random pick, I came up with the name Daniel Camargo Barbosa for Denise to research. So how did that go, Denise? Uh, I think it went fairly okay. He's actually pretty popular, um, but... I'm not the one that's reading it. So there seems to be a lot of people that fell off the face of the earth on this one. But then again, if I was in this kind of life, I think I would change my name and become a new person. Wouldn't you? If I was involved in this man's yeah. life? Yeah. Oh yeah, this guy is, is a monster. Yeah, if I knew him or was family or anything or just a, a friend from before, I would totally disengage from him and change everything about myself. Yeah, for the little things I've seen about this case, he is a vile person. Yeah. He created some heinous acts down there in Colombia. Oh, yeah. So we're going to uh, jump right into this. Perfect. Okay, so Daniel Camargo Barbosa was born January 22nd in 1930 in Analema in Colombian Andes, Cundin Amarca, Colombia. Those are some... Good job. <laughs> yeah, those are tough. Not going to lie. <laughs> So he is one of the top five most infamous psychopathic rapists and serial killers by body count alone. He is also known as Manuel Bulgarian Solis, and he was a Colombian prolific robber, serial rapist, and later serial killer, and a stalker active in Colombia and Ecuador. It is believed he raped and killed up to 150 young girls during the 1970s and 80s. That's a lot. That is a staggering amount. Yeah. See, that's why I would change my name. Everything about myself. Oh, yeah. Like, you don't want to know this guy. No. You don't want to be a young girl either around him because, yeah, that was his MO, young girls. Yep. So, Daniel came from a wealthy family. His father, Daniel Camargo Brancino, was a businessman who had already married once before and they had a daughter. Then he met his second wife, Teresa Barbosa. Unfortunately... Daniel's mother died before he even reached the age of one. So he, and, uh, so he was raised by his father, and he was very overbearing and emotionally distant. Mm -hmm. And that's when Daniel's hatred of femininity began. Afterwards, his father remarried to a psychologically disturbed woman named Diocelino Fernandez, who was just a mere child herself. Yeah, she was young. Oh, really? Do you know her age? No, it didn't say her age. It was just she was like not... You, you wouldn't marry somebody this age right now, like okay. a teenager. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I get it. Okay. And uh, she had infertility problems and wanted a daughter of her own. This caused his new stepmother to become abusive towards Daniel. She would humiliate him in various ways. Her cruelty for him went as far as undressing him from the waist down and beating him with a bullwhip. While Daniel was getting abused in the household, his half-sister was being doted on. Yeah, and of spoiler. course, yeah, that enraged him. Mm -hmm. Daniel had violent tendencies after that. Oh, wouldn't you? Oh, I would, definitely. His stepmother would take his pants away and force him to wear girls' clothing at home and at school. That's humiliation right there. Yeah, that is big time. She would even stick pins into him. While wearing a dress, she would invite his classmates over just to laugh at him. Isn't that horrible? It is. It's extremely horrible. It's like mentally abusive torture oh yeah daniel lost any popularity he had and became bullying by his stepmother and his classmates yeah i i kind of start to blame the stepmother at this point for the man he turned into oh yeah it seems that she, way right now yeah, yeah she kind of created a monster because he had all potential of being a good kid until she came in the picture and yeah and it seems as the experts pointed out that the woman had a frustrated desire to have a girl. She compensated by forcing Daniel to dress as a girl at school and even presented himself with a female name. Do you know that name? No, I'm, I'm thinking it may be Daniela or something. Oh, yeah, Daniela or something like mm -hmm. that, yeah. Daniel recounted these events years later. Oh, yeah, that'd be traumatic, reliving it. You know, PTSD and everything. Yeah. A professor, Absalon Jimenez Becerra, Concluded after investigating the case, he said, By the mistreatment and rejection of this woman generates in Daniel as a hatred towards the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. His father drank a lot. 
Some would call him an alcoholic by the amount of uh, drinking he was doing, and uh, he was too consumed with his business. He was a distant authoritarian and a severe man. A few times when he did deal with his son, it was usually to give him brutal beatings, helped on by the boy's uncle. I don't know the name of the uncle or anything. Oh, no? Okay. No. Eventually, Daniel lost all interest in interacting with his father, and he perfected his newfound ability to lie and manipulate people, using it as means to get out of having conversations with them. Oh, I do the same thing. So he's kind of almost turning into a narcissist right here, trying to manipulate and... Well, I think he was trying to manipulate his father, like, oh, I'm busy, I'm doing this or that, but even when he wasn't, just so he can get out of these conversations with his father and stay yeah. away from his father because his father was abusive. He was. It seems like his whole family was abusive. Right yeah. Now. So now the abuse that Daniel's stepmother gave him caused him to emotionally reject his father. And he lost interest with them and withdrew from his family altogether. Yeah, because his father didn't back him up at all when she was doing all this stuff to him. Yeah, it seems like, like there was no help for him. No, your son is being dressed up like a girl and being treated like a girl and humiliated. And you're letting your newfound wife do this to your son. Yeah, exactly. That's just as much abuse as what she's doing. Yep, 100%. So now in the early 1940s, his father sent him to a prestigious all-male Catholic boarding school in the capital, Bagoda. 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 Despite this humiliation, Daniel stood out as a great student in the Leon 13 School of Borgata, with a reported IQ of 116. They are smart. Yeah, that's above average for sure. Like, it's mm -hmm. not like you're not going to Mensa or anything like that. But No, but you're, you know, you have a head on your shoulders. You are ahead of a lot of people. Yeah cases we've covered before like cody i'm pretty sure wasn't even close to that no <laughs> there's a few other ones that were probably even the last episode wasn't yeah some you know, of them weren't you know, well we already said just confess not to the it brightest stars stuff? in the sky yeah. yeah some of them were oh, i hate to say the word but they just weren't all there but yeah he's that's pretty smart that's a high iq mm -hmm. he had so much potential like i said everything like if it wasn't for his family he i think he was going to go somewhere probably so now he played basketball and soccer, and he was quite an avid reader. However, his desire to continue study was always hampered when he was forced on a drop out of school when his family was hit with an economic downturn caused by La Violencia, Colombia's civil war that started in 1948. Yeah, I didn't know about this war. In Neither have I. Yeah. So now to it was help. quite the war. Was it? Mm -hmm. Now to help his family, he became a traveling salesman and noted how easily he could convince people to let them inside their homes. Manipulate them. Yeah, exactly. Now, La Violencia was a 10-year civil war in Colombia from 1948 to 1958. It was between the Colombian Conservation Party and the Colombian Liberal Party, which was fought mainly in the countryside. La Violencia is considered to have begun on April 9, 1948, with the assassination of Jorge Alancer Gaitan. He was a Liberal Party presidential candidate for the 1949 November election. His murder provoked the Botazo rioting, which lasted 10 hours and resulted in around 5,000 casualties. See, it was a huge that's pretty war. Big. Yeah, and that's only 10 hours. Yeah. And there's more. This is 10 years. Mm hmm So this war was mainly consisted of peasant-to-peasant -peasant violence throughout Colombia between the liberals and the conservatives, mm -hmm. pretty much. That's pretty yeah. much the gist of it. There you go. So La Valenza is estimated to have cost the lives of at least 200,000 people, almost 2% of the population in the country at the time. Isn't that crazy? That's a lot. It is 10 that's, years, too. That's, but still, that's a huge war. 2% of the population. Over a war, yeah, yeah, exactly. As an adult, Daniel was thin, introverted, and harmless looking. He only reached 5'4 in height, which is not very big. He was a petite man. Yeah. In 1957, he met a client. Alcita Casillo, and after just a few dates, he convinced her to rent a house and began a de facto union and had two children with her. Which is just um, two persons living together, like um, we are in common law relationship. Yeah, it's, it's, two people it's living common under, law, pretty much. Yeah, right? it's yeah. two people living under one Without household. Without being married. Exactly. Yeah. So their happiness was then short-lived, and Daniel soon found himself unable to cover all the family expenses. He tried to rob a store owned by another client, but was caught a few hours later and sent to a minimum security prison on May 24th, 1958. So robbery was not his forte. 
It's not mine either. I get caught for everything I do. <laughs> That's good. I'm happy about that. Yeah. So easily he then <laughs> Denise, escaped. is this your husband? <laughs> you want to take him again? <laughs> yeah, I get caught for everything. I, I, don't, I, get, I don't get away with anything around here. No, but you don't steal either. No. Easily he escaped prison. I just stole your heart. Aww. <laughs> you did. That's so sweet. Oh, my God. I'm blushing. <laughs> I love you. I love you too. So then easily he escaped prison. Taking advantage of a distraction, he took a clipboard from the desk and pretended to be busy and walked out with the departing officers at the end of the shift. Pretty ballsy. Yeah, just walked out with other workers. <laughs> just pretend you're a worker, grab the clipboard and walk out. Yeah. That's confidence right there. Very confident. Returning to his family, he lived a quiet life until 1962. However, his happy marriage fell apart when in 1967, he surprised his wife and found her in bed with another man. Oh, another woman to break his heart. Yeah, I came home from work a little bit early, I guess. Mm-hmm. Eh? At that time, though, hatred for women was Daniel's vital engine that drove and him. Honestly, I don't blame him at this point. Oh, right now, a lot of women have treated him very, very bad. Yeah. He started to get a big Vi- hatred for them. Yeah, and they were vital people in his life that yeah. treated him like well, shit. Women that were supposed to love him. Yeah, unconditionally. So as he would confess years later on, he considered the female sex to be the blame for all the evils that had befallen him in life. From that moment on, the hatred toward women would be so great that Daniel would consider females as a root of all bad things that happened to him in life. So now after the separation from Alcida, Daniel rebuilt his life with another woman named Esperanza. I like that name, Esperanza. That's a great name. Who he was obsessed with for supposedly being a virgin. So now he had to deflower this virgin. That's mm. kind of Daniel's M.O. Yeah. However, as soon as Daniel discovered that she had already been with another man, he used his skills of manipulation to convince her that uh, she disappointed him and that she would make it up to him by providing him with virgin girls so he could take their virginity in her place and fulfill all his fantasies. Mm-hmm. That's, so, I, I kind of want to know how that conversation went. Oh, <laughs> you're sitting around watching TV one day, be like, "Hey, you want to go get me a virgin?" Yeah, you uh, you didn't give me my gift of virginity, so you need to go out and get that for me. Yeah. So now Daniel and Esperanza formed an agreement that he would stay with her if she helped him find victims, lure them into their apartment, and drug them with psychobarbital so he could rape them. Now. Yeah, it's a sleeping pill. It's a, it's a sleeping pill. It's a barbiturate that uh, slows the activity of your brain and nervous system. It is used to treat short-term insomnia as a sedative before surgery. Oh, so they would be really knocked out then. Oh, exactly. It's like having a date rape drug. Yeah. Pretty much the same thing. Like, you pretty much lose all inhibition. Yeah, they wouldn't even know what happened. No, probably not, no. This began a period of their two-year partnership into crime, which lasted until 1964. Daniel said... I wasn't able to leave her because I was madly in love with her. There were times when I said, yes, I'll leave her, but other times I was not capable of it. This resulted in that since I had no experience with virgin women, and at the same time I was unable to leave that girl, I accepted as the most correct thing that she helped me with to get some girls who were virgins. I don't believe in that was love though. Because you don't get somebody that you love to go get other girls so then you can deflower them. That's no. not love. Maybe he had lust for her, but that's not love. I think it was an excuse saying I, I loved her, but... Yeah, exactly. So Daniel committed five rapes in this manner, but he did not kill any of these girls. Not yet. In February 1964, the fifth girl, Maria Alexandra Velez, remembered what happened to her and went to the police. Not long after this, on April 10th, 1964, so only a couple months later, Mm -hmm. both Daniel and Esperanza were arrested for sexual assault and taken to separate prisons. A judge sentenced Daniel to three years of prison. He was initially grateful for the leniency the judge gave him, swearing to repent and mend his ways. However, a new judge was given precedence over the case and Daniel was instead sentenced to eight years in prison. This provoked Daniel to a rebellious anger. So he goes from three years to eight years. Yeah, which I think three years was pretty lenient. It's very lenient. Yeah, exactly. So he felt like a victim and decided that he would not risk leaving another victim alive. Yeah, that was his turning point to murder. Well, yeah, he didn't want to spend more time in prison. He wanted to just get away with it. 
dead men can't talk. Dead women can't talk, I guess. Is it like a Johnny Depp reference now? <laughs> dead men tell no tales. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Up until 2015, there was no laws of femicide. Now, Denise, you could tell me what a femicide is. Oh, I can. Femicide is a hate crime term, which is defined as the intentional killing of women or girls because they are female. Yep. So let's kill them because they're a girl. Yeah, that's it. That's the yep. only reason. Daniel ended up serving his full sentence and then he was released. So he ended up doing his full term of eight years. Mm-hmm. Upon his release, Daniel moved to Brazil and continued on with his criminal activities. In 1973, Daniel was arrested in Brazil for being undocumented. No papers. No papers. No green card. Yep. Due to a delay in sending his criminal records from Colombia to Brazil, he was deported and released with his false identity. Right, so they didn't know who he was. No. When he then returned to Colombia, he took up a job as a television street vendor in Barranquilla, which is located near the Caribbean Sea, and that is the largest city with the third largest port. So it seems like a bustling city for sure. Oh, yeah. Sounds huge. Okay, so now we're going to move on to May 2nd, 1974. Oh, so this is movie time. Beetlejuice. 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 It's showtime. Honestly, I had to say Beetlejuice there. It just makes me like I so pumped. I always want to, yeah. Okay, so this one's a really tough one. I like a challenge. Um. Well, this is before your time, so. A few, a few years, yeah. yeah. 1974, yeah? Yeah. Not so, there yet. <laughs> no. You weren't even a thought at that point. No. Um, this My is, mother was 10, I think. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was 10. So this one is, it's about a murder of a mutual friend. Okay. It's got some big people in there. What are the names? Um, it has Paul Newman. Okay. The big one is Robert Redford. Okay. Not yet? Not yet. Robert Shaw. Okay. Nope. Okay. <laughs> it's got mob. A mob movie with Paul Newman. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I've never seen it. I've never seen any Paul Newman movies, so I'm already at a hindrance. Yeah, it's a hard one. Because um, it's like, you know, Robert Redford, it's like old-time movie. Yeah, you know, I, I think I might have heard of it, probably. I bet you have heard of it. I've never seen it. I'm, I'm sure not, you have. I'm not going to try to guess at it. You might as well tell me it. I would be just, I'm just drawing a blank. A bee does this. Buzz? Sting? Yeah. The Sting? Yeah. Really? Yep. Okay. The Sting. Have you watched it? No. <laughs> See, that was a hard one. That See? was a tough one. Well, 1974, when we get to these dates, they are going to be a lot tougher because, I mean, my Haiti was the 80s and 90s, right? Yeah, that's true. So. So what are you going to do when we get to like the 1930s? Well, Casablanca, <laughs> Miller on the <laughs> Roof, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Wizard of Oz, maybe? I know a couple. <laughs> I'm going to have to do like charades. We, we, we can try that. <laughs> no. Remember me and charades? Yeah. I had, uh, what, Jar Jar Banks? Yeah. That was, yeah, <laughs> that was funny. By the way, that was a good one. It was a tough that, one. That was really hard. That's going to be hard for everyone. Oh, yeah. Unless people really know their movies. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty but sure most people do. I thought that when I said Robert Redford, you might. I don't. Clue the only in. really Robert Redford movie I've ever really watched was the was it the Natural, the baseball movie. I think it was in that. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. We give it a shot. Yeah, I'm trying to think of movies I've seen with him. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll keep on moving now. Indecent proposal. Right. Oh yeah. Anyway, that was a good one today. Okay. I give it a shot. Yeah. You would never have got that one I gave oh, it to you. Oh, God, no. No, we both. I, I, I think know that 100%. That one. I would not. Yeah. I can't get them the best of times. <laughs> the easy ones. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ready? You bet. Okay. On May 2nd, 1974, Daniel was walking in front of a school in Barranquilla where he saw a nine-year-old girl he found attractive. He lured her into a secluded area, raped her, and strangled her. Leaving the body mistakenly in the place with the TV sets that he was transporting. I just, 
don't understand how you could look at a nine year old and think find of her them. attractive. Yeah. I know they're children. I see it like a nine year old. It's like, oh, what a cutie, you know, but not attractive. Attractive, I use as an older person term. Yeah, exactly. This was his first assault involving murder. Because uh, now he didn't want to get caught and leave any uh, witnesses behind. Mm hmm. On May 3rd, Daniel returned to dispose of the body and retrieve the television sets that he had forgotten beside the girl. But he was followed by a police officer who suspected him and immediately arrested him. How can you be that smart and yet yeah, no kidding. leave a t you know, television sets there? Even though it is believed that he raped and killed more than 80 girls in Colombia, Daniel was imprisoned in Colombia. After being convicted of raping and killing a nine-year-old girl, he was obsessed with her purity, with the chassis symbol of virginity, and when he had to choose, he always turned to girls or teenagers with an innocent appearance. He despised prostitutes, a symbol not only of sin, but of diseases and imperfections. And adult women were considered impure, who had long since lost their chastity. Yeah. So yeah, he was definitely looking for... Her. You know, young girls who were, like, were pure. Mm -hmm. And he found any other girl that looked pure, he didn't spend any time with them. Yeah. If they were young, his odds were that they were still a virgin. Yeah. He was... A, well, nine years old. Come on. Nine years old is uh, pretty young. He was initially sentenced to 30 years in prison, but the sentence was reduced to 25, and he was interned in the prison on the island of Gorgona, Colombia, on December 24th, 1977. Mm-hmm. Now, this place was considered a hell on earth by the victor of Peru, Francisco Pizarro, who had spent 13 months there following a shipwreck. So now a little history lesson for you is that he defeated the Incas and executed their leader, which then in turn conquered Peru for the Spanish. So that's who he was. Mm -hmm. He was a Spanish conquistador. Conquistador? What yes. is a conquistador? Pretty much just a uh, explorer. Okay. Uh, the Gorgona is the last stop for murderers and rapists who receive brutal treatment here. The weakest prisoners are subject to the same treatment they gave their victims. Good. Tortured sorry. and raped. Yeah. No, don't be sorry. Okay. In a penal colony designed on the model of the Nazi concentration camps. So it's pretty. Brutal. Yeah. yeah. I would say brutal. Yeah. Brutal's you don't want to be weak there. No. <laughs> you want to find, you know, a big chap and make him your... Your boyfriend and you're his bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Hold my pocket. <laughs> so 10 years into his sentence, September 24th, 1984, Daniel managed to circumvent all the security measures of the prison. See? Smarts. Very smart. <laughs> Took him 10 years. He, he spent 10 years trying to escape. Yeah, but he had a game plan that he was he did. following and it was time consuming. Yep. Yeah. It is on this day, Our Lady of Mercy, September 24th, and uh, the controls were less vigorous. Yeah, that's a special day for them, Our Lady Mercy. Yeah. Over time, he managed to hide a makeshift raft with wooden planks that was held together by bark of tropical trees found on the island. He hid this raft in the vegetation, camouflaged from the gazes of the guards. Once he managed to study the officials' work schedules, it was the time to make his escape. So he was studying them and just yeah. figuring out a way to get out of yep. there. It wasn't just a uh, get out quick. It was, you know, if you get out quick, you might get caught. Yep. So he was really planning it so his escape would be long term. Yep. So immediately he jumped on the raft and didn't stop paddling until he reached the mainland. Three days later. Mm -hmm. Spent three days out there battling currents and all that kind of stuff. Yep. I bet. Yep. The prison did report him as a fugitive. But at the same time, they assumed he just died at sea, since they believed that the currents were too treacherous to navigate without experience. Uh, do we know what sea this is? So, yeah, we just looked it up, and they said that he died at sea, but that sea is the Pacific Ocean. Not a sea at all. No, it's the ocean. So they just assumed he died at, well, I guess they could just say died at sea, and it makes a little more sense than saying died in the ocean. I don't know. I would have said ocean. Me too. The Pacific <laughs> Ocean, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, they just assumed he died. Mm -hmm. So the press even ran stories about how Daniel had been eaten by sharks. In truth, Daniel spent the preceding years studying the tides, sea currents, and the winds, even reading books about the navigation. 
and learning to orient himself with precision and drawing up an escape plan. Mm -hmm. Daniel was the first prisoner to ever escape of what has been dubbed the Colombian version of Alcatraz. Probably because it was on an island, right? Yeah. That island is now a park. Okay. As soon as he landed, Daniel ran south towards the Ecuadorian border. In a new country where he had no criminal record, Daniel once again began to commit his crimes with total impunity in the city of Guayaquil, Ecuador. Did I say that right? Guayaquil. Guayaquil. Sounds good? Yeah. Okay. He committed the majority of his murders in Guayaquil in the Goyas province. It was only four years after Pedro Alonso Lopez, the monster of the Andes, was arrested for killing up to 300 women and girls. That these killings began once again, and that is a monster of a case, and I'm probably pretty sure we're going to do it sometime. No. No? That case is being done. Okay, we're not going to do it. Yeah, I actually looked it up because I thought, oh, that one looks interesting, but it's been done. Okay, we're so not going to So if you want to learn about that. There's probably a lot of other podcasts out there. Yeah, listen to someone else's podcast and (laughs) save yourself some time. (laughs) Okay. So, just to be known, we're not going to do that one? (laughs) No. Okay. But I do want to hear it. Yeah. Okay, so now back to our case. Yeah. Daniel was able to get these adolescent girls from small but impenetrable area, or so they thought. Yeah. He would try to get these girls to follow him, but if they resisted... He would let them go and move on to the next one. Right. So, he wanted an easy target. Easy targets, yeah. So he didn't want to like bend over back to get somebody. He'd just right. find somebody else. Exactly. So perhaps the next would be easier to lure. Mm-hmm. The young girl would be led to a secluded spot and raped at knife point, and then strangled, stabbed, and cut up with a machete. What a horrible death. For young women. Holy. Yeah, children. One young woman hit him over the head with a rock. That enraged him so much, he decapitated her and threw her head away. Wow, he has something wrong upstairs. Being burned a lot. This doesn't, does not make up for that. No, um, I think he's being burned and it he's got a screw. Loose? Loose or yeah. multiple screws loose. So another woman was dissected with her lungs, kidneys, and heart extracted. His victims were mainly young girls and virgins. If they weren't a virgin, it was by mistake. Because how does a person, a sane person, well, they're not sane, but pull out organs? I know. It's not sane at all. Like, you have to visually see these organs in somebody's body and pull them out. Yep. That is not just being brought up wrong. Extreme deep hatred. Now, for 15 months, the Ecuadorian population lived in a terror of presence of a murderer. They didn't believe there could be another maniac around again. The authorities initially believed that the murders was the work of organized crime. Many rumors pointed to the white slavery rings, satanic cults, or powerful people who are then protected by the authorities. And didn't we just talk about satanic cults and stuff the last episode? We did. So this is a, you know, this is earlier than that one, but it's the same area. Like, it always seems like it was the satanic panic was going on all over the place. The last one was in the, the 90s. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe look it up. I don't know if more um, people believe in satanic cults more so down in South America. Yeah, maybe. So, the most accurate rumor was one claiming that new serial killer nicknamed the Beast of the Andes had decided to beat the record set earlier by Lopez's numbers of victims. Unfortunately, the police found no clues as the killer was extremely careful in his crimes because he had that IQ, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's probably leaving no trace. Imagine being the people, though, thinking that there's somebody out out there trying to beat the last person's crime rate. Numbers, yeah. Yeah. That almost reminds me of the movie The Frighteners, when uh, Michael J. Fox in it, Mm -hmm. and he, uh, the killer, was like killing to beat the numbers of the like of other serial killers as he was dead already. Uh, He would put the numbers on their foreheads, and uh, when uh, somebody was about to die, the number would show up there as uh, what number there was the killing. And uh, Michael J. Fox was able to see the ghosts and uh, the numbers. It was a pretty good movie. So he was going for, like, the serial killer in that movie. Um, it was uh, Jake Busey, I believe. He was actually going for uh, the higher kill counts of uh, previous serial killers. Wow. Okay. Didn't know that. And you've never seen it. I've heard of it. Does that count? 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. So now Daniel traveled to the capital of Quito in the Andes. But during the cold night of December 5th or 6th in 1984, he traveled by bus back to the coast, the city of Quevedo, southwest of Quito. I am not Spanish. These names are a little tough for me. Uh, they, they probably roll their tongues and stuff yeah. like that. And I cannot roll my tongue. <laughs> I can't do that. That's not rolling my tongue. That's just my throat. <laughs> oh, I can't do that. Okay. Days later, on December 18th, 1984, Daniel settled in Quevedo, Ecuador, and began targeting lower class girls by disguising himself as a harmless figure, such as a pastor or a beggar. Daniel abducted another nine-year-old girl in Quevedo, in the province of Los Rios, Ecuador, and killed her. The next day, a 10-year-old girl also disappeared. Meanwhile, Daniel Barbosa lived in a situation near poverty. To buy himself something to eat, he acts as a porter at the market, an activity that is worth less than a dollar a day. Not much money. No. Occasionally, he supplemented his income by selling clothing or small valuables belonging to his victims. So he was taking souvenirs and selling them. Yep. He slept on the benches of public parks and portrayed himself as an evangelical man. Bible in hand, he introduces himself in the street to women or girls, telling of being a foreigner and of being lost. He tells them he's looking for a pastor of a church and does not know how to go about doing it. So he asks them for help to search for the elusive preacher. Many ignored him and continued on their way, but others accepted, and when the situation became dire, Daniel threatened them with a knife. He is a small man, but he has grown strong thanks to unloading crates at the market, and over the years has developed a determination that leaves no way out for the victims. His determined desire to kill outweighed the young girl's strength to survive. He always forced them to conceal themselves from the other passerbys under the threat of the knife. In the shelter of the shrubs that border the mangrove channels, where the noise of the city traffic mingles with the sounds of nature, he rapes them. And then when he finishes, instead of letting them go free, like he promises them, he strangles them. When he heard the police were on his heels, he changed cities, continuing to kill in Quito, Machala, Noble, Ambado, and Quevedo. He went on to commit at least 54 rapes and murders of both young girls and adult women between 1984 and 1986. That's a lot in two years. That's a huge number. He began to mutilate and eviscerate his victims, even taking out their hearts, which he called the organ of love. From December 18th, 1984, until the end of February 1986, the forest near the town of Guayaquil was filled with the corpses of girls and young women who had been raped and strangled, even fiercely stabbed. These improvised cemeteries housed bodies in many states of decomposition which is due to heat and also been food for uh, vultures. So there were hardly any bones or remains to recover. I can imagine that. Yeah. It's hot there. Very hot there. and Humid. Humid, yeah. There's a lot of animals, a lot of wildlife Mm -hmm. going around. So yeah, there's not much left of these girls. At 55 years old, Daniel, who looked beyond his years, slept in Guayaquil Park, showed off his literary training thanks to his time in Gorgona by citing Vargas Loosa, Hess, or Nietzsche in their conversations. He was a brilliant psychopath, able to talk about God and about the devil with great ease, and who acted alone when he perpetrated the crimes. With 54 victims, it caused a wave of fury and general panic throughout the country. The people wanted to find the culprits. At first, the authorities believed it was a group of rapists that was uh, behind the series of crimes. Squads equipped with weapons were even formed, and the female population was asked to dress modest and reduce the temptation of kidnapping and rape. Which, really, I... Change your appearance, just like they did with Ted Bundy and all those ones we've talked about already. Yeah, I suppose, but if he really wants to rape people, you can... He's going to do it. Yeah, you can dress modestly, and he's going to still attack. And these are children that he's attacking. Like, most of them are children that he's attacking, and they're already dressing modestly. I was just about to say that. The women that he's going for are young women who are nine, who he sexualizes, which yeah. is like, it doesn't matter what they dress like, he's going to find a way right. to make it sexual. It's not like they're dressing like a hoochie. No, exactly. <laughs> On February 26, 1986, Daniel's now at the age of 56, 
he murdered his last victim. She was an eight-year-old girl named Elizabeth Telpes. In the woods, Daniel fled the scene of the crime. In order to get rid of his bloody clothes, he shoved them into his suitcase. Thanks to the increased surveillance in the area, a police patrol officer noticed him at the height of Los Granados. From a distance, he noticed him looking disheveled and suspicious looking carrying a suitcase. So he decided to ask for his documentation. That guy was on the ball. Yeah, he was. Just like that police officer in Cody Legibakov case. Oh, Doing yeah. his job, you know. Yeah. All you gotta do. He said his name was Manuel Solis Bulgarian. Sounds about right. I don't know. Manuel sure. Solis Bulgarian. I'm sure that the Spanish people are just shaking their heads. Probably. Listening to this going, oh my God. This guy's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they, these people are butchering our names. <laughs> if you guys want to hear some really butcher names, go back to our Leonardo one when I started talking Italy. Ooh, oh, that yeah. was a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny, though. So now at the police station, they took a statement. They did not know that they were facing the monster of the mangroves. That was the moniker they gave him. A dangerous serial killer who fled from Colombia in 1984. This guy's got many names, though. Many names, yep. In a bag he was carrying, they found bloody clothes and the clitoris of his latest victim. Oh, God. Can you... I... Yeah. Well, it's a young girl. She was young. Yeah. As a guy kind of like closes his legs thinking about getting hit in the crotch, I'm like clamping. He also had a copy of the book Crime and Punishment. Weren't you talking about Crime and Punishment in another episode? Possibly. Was it... um, no, no, that was a different book. That was, was uh, it a different book? That was a, The Rye and the Catcher. That's the right. The Catcher and the Rye. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to say the uh, author of this because I won't be able to pronounce it, and I'm already in a lot of trouble for pronouncing names. So if you guys want to look into Crime and Punishment, take a look. So now during the, the several hours of interrogation, Daniel calmly confessed to killing 72 girls in Ecuador since escaping from the Colombian prison 15 months prior. It's like he's proud. Oh, I know. In addition, the man, also known as the sadist of the puddle, boasted of remembering the identity of more than 170 girls he had raped and strangled in the last 15 years. Yeah, the sadist of the puddle, another name that was given him. Yep. They moved him to Guayaquil for identification and was later identified by Maria Alexander Velez. And if you guys remember, that was the young girl at the beginning who first ID'd him. Yep. Who was one of the rape victims that had escaped. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel led authorities to the dumping grounds of those victims whose bodies had not yet been recovered yet. He had proof and gave incredible details of the victims he killed, like their names and trivial details. Yeah, it's like there were awards or something. He just memorized things and all these people. Yeah, he knew that they had moles, scars, tattoos, or clothing, and jewelry like rings or necklaces. He remembered all those little things. Yeah, I was questioning that. I when find I, it, it must have been the tattoos, must have been the older ones he went for. Well, yeah, sure those are going to be nine-year-olds, are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every little thing that can connect his murderous act to a specific victim was given. He even confessed to having taken trophies like their clitoris. He said he was attracted by their angelic faces, by the crying and pleading of the girls, by being the master of their destiny. That's sick. That's narcissism right there. That's like that God thing again. Yep. After raping his victims, he hacked and slashed and crushed the girls with a machete to mislead the investigation. Then he urinated on his hands to wash off the blood and change his shirt. Always the same every time. So that was his MO for sure. That's just sick. According to Daniel, he killed because he wanted revenge on the woman's unfaithfulness. He hated them for not being what he believed women were supposed to be. Yeah, but a nine-year-old is supposed to be a nine-year-old. And And they're supposed to be pure and angelic. There's no reason for it. No. So he also showed no remorse or feelings for anything that he ever did. In interviews, he would demand large sums of money for interviews, and uh, the police would then block the access. Yeah, he's trying to bribe them. Francisco Febreze Cordero and Marco Huardo... Our two reporters who posed as psychologists managed to get long interviews with him. Yeah, they tricked him. Yep. Their testimony will be the one and only few that is delivered to the public. He's now thin of short stature with a hollow face, a cigarette between his fingers, 
Daniel confidently answered questions to these false psychologists. In their words, they are faced with a person that they define as brilliant, with above average culture, who speaks English and Portuguese, and he also speaks Spanish. Barbosa retraces the stages of his life, from his unhappy childhood to his first murder, from his escape from Gorgona to the dozens of murders in Ecuador. He is cold, lucid, and Daniel has an answer to everything. Contrary to what has been told to the investigators, he confesses that he regrets his crimes, even if he admits something is stirring his head that he cannot control. The experience with this monster will leave its mark. One of the survivors recounted, He was strange and convinced me in such a way that he cried and told me, Miss, I ask you in the name of our Lord, because I am an evangelical who does no harm to anyone, who would mistrust a man with a slow voice and a Bible in his hands from him. Another young woman said, He seemed like a defenseless man, very calm, calm. He insisted that I accompany him, but not by force. He inspired pity. Manipulated. Yep. So now Daniel maintains his cheeky demeanor even during his trial. He has studied the Ecuadorian procedural code and knows that he cannot be sentenced to more than 16 years in prison. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the max yeah, for all this, right? 16. Holy. He also tells reporters the years that await him in prison are not a great deal because he will eventually go free. In February 1988, the Quagel court proceeded to hold a trial against Daniel Camargo Barbosa. He was accused of all the crimes of kidnapping, rape, and murder of 71 victims. During the hearing, the psychiatrist would evaluate him and conclude that they are dealing with a systematic criminal and a psychopathic personality. In addition, Daniel Barbosa lived according to the Indian religious leader Oso's precept. If you don't live dangerously, you don't live. Life only blooms in danger. Life never blooms in safety. When everything is going perfectly, look, you're dying and nothing happens. That sounds pretty ominous. It, it is. Therefore, he was an irrecoverable criminal. Apart from the testimony of the professionals, the statements of the victims who managed to escape and save their lives were also the key to the proceedings. In 1989, Judge Edgar Salazar Vera sentenced Daniel Camargo to 16 years in prison for the murder of 72 females, the maximum available in Ecuador at the time. Isn't that sick? So, so little. The lawyer for the victims' families complained about the lack of years, and rightfully so. Yeah. I would be doing the same thing. Oh, God, yeah. After the verdict, Daniel was sent to the Litoral Prison, known officially as the Center for Social Rehabilitation of Men in Guayaquil, and is the largest prison in Ecuador. It is located 16.5 kilometers from the Via Adal in the outskirts of Guayadal. It's a huge prison. Apparently. Okay, so here's a fun fact. On September... 28th, 2021, prison was the scene of the Guayaquil prison riot, a massacre during in which 119 inmates were killed as a result of clashes between criminal gangs. Due to the high number of victims, the massacre is considered the bloodiest prison riot in Ecuador history. It sounds like there's a lot of uh, prison riots down there. It sounds like it. Mm -hmm. It's a party. Yeah. Huh. Today that has changed. Now the Ecuadorian justice punishes the crime with between 19 and 22 years. And if there is murder, the sentence rises to 26 years. Thank God. Yeah. Regarding the accumulation of sentences, we speak of a maximum of 40 years. It should be. Yeah. Especially like the serial murders. And he only got 16 and thankfully they they raised it to 40. He should be doing life or yeah. death penalty. He should be staying in prison until he passes away or... yeah. I do believe in execution. Certain, I'm not going to go into it, but yeah. Uh, everybody has their own Everyone beliefs. has their own views. But at certain points, and when you admit that you've murdered all these people and you are a serial murderer, well, why should you stay in prison and use taxpayers' money? Yeah, exactly. I just think, be gone with you and because you're not going to get better. You're not going to get out of prison. So that's just my view. Yep. And I'm entitled to it. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> it is believed that Daniel Barbosa killed more than 150 women or even more than 200. That's, see, execution. Yeah. 
There is a detailed investigation of his murders in the book The Monsters in Colombia Do Exist by anthropologist Esteban Cruz Nino. In it, part of his personal diary is told and it is established that he spoke perfect English and Portuguese. Daniel was later transferred to Quito's Garcia Moreno Prison. After 140 years, the prison was shut down in 2014 and turned into a museum. Coincidentally, he was imprisoned in the same cell that housed Pedro Alonso Lopez, which we talked about earlier. He was the monster of the Andes. Right, the one that uh, people thought he was trying to beat his numbers. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that weird that they end up in the same cell together? Same block. like The same yeah, cell block, whatever. Probably not together at the same time, but he was in the cell probably after him. Oh, they were in the same time. Oh, were they? Yeah. Wow. They probably just talked about murder like crazy. I know. So, what's your count at? <laughs> oh, I know. That, that, that's all, probably all they talked about. They probably got off on it, too. I bet you they did. The guards kept him and Lopez isolated for the rest of the inmates in fear of reprisals. Yeah, they were um, segregated, I guess. Yeah, so it was just them two all day together. Yeah. Man, to be a fly on the wall, right? Oh, my God, yes. Things I don't want to hear, probably. Oh, they're probably reminiscing about all their kills and, oh, my God, they probably have all detailed, like... What they should do yeah. is had, like, um, microphones in there listening to them. Well, I mean, they've already confessed, right? So I don't know if they need to have microphones. Learn about serial killers? I don't know. Sunday, November 13th, 1994, on the Day of Visitors, a new inmate, 29-year-old Giovanni Jeremio, entered Daniel's open cell and ordered him to drop to his knees. After saying, it is the hour of vengeance, Giovanni shanked Daniel eight times. He planned to take his head, but his weapon was unable to cut through the tissue and the bones of his neck. So now unable to decapitate him? Giovanni instead settled for his ear, which he sliced off and took with him. When the guards came, Giovanni proudly showed off his trophy. His aunt, as it turns out, had been one of Daniel's victims. In killing Daniel, Giovanni had managed to avenge her death. Mm -hmm. So now, because nobody claimed his body, he was buried in a mass grave with the number 798 of the Albatan Necropolis in Quito at the age of 64. I think he had a good death. Yeah, it was well fitting for him. Yep. Now in the TV series Criminal Minds, which we've probably all watched. Oh yeah. Daniel was never mentioned or referenced on the show, but he appears to have been an inspiration to some of the cases. That's neat. I well, find that really Yeah, I mean, Criminal Minds probably takes a lot of references from serial killers. Well, yeah, they probably take references all over the world. Oh yeah, for sure. So that's going to do for the case of Daniel Barbosa. That, that's a crazy case. Yeah. So I guess you want to ask me what I rate him? I do. That's a 10 for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they're children. Children, yeah. Like, I know. Like, yeah, it's it's so sad that yeah. a lot of these young women had to like die on the hands of him. Yeah. Their heads bashed in and sliced and their clitoris ripped, like cut off and their organs being ripped out of their chest. And it's just really sick. Yeah, this guy was pretty brutal on that list. What's sad is he had so much potential. He was smart. He could have done a lot of things with his life. Yep. He chose this. Yep. Okay, so our next episode, we're going to be heading to Iran. I ran away. I ran so far away by a flock of seagulls. I ran. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sing. <laughs> Neither one of us should be singing. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let us know at uh, what you guys think about this at World's True Crime at hotmail.com. Yeah, let us know about cases that you want us to do. Yeah, and also, too, what you guys can really do to help us out is pass this along to your friends and family. Yeah. Let that really helps us out more than anything else in the world is just get uh, people, you know, get us known. Yep. And yeah, we can also check us out on Instagram at World's True Crime. On Facebook. On Facebook, World's yep. True Crime. And now we want to also thank uh, Samantha, Denise's daughter, for her artwork. And hopefully we're going to get more soon. Oh, it's weird that you called her Samantha. It's like she's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. Yeah, I kind of bug her about that. When's my artwork coming in? Yeah. And uh, just a little uh, little note here. We actually did this episode a little bit earlier in the week because I have a baseball tournament on the weekend. So we're not going to be able to record then. Nope. But so we're doing this a little bit earlier. I'm just glad I got it all researched and done the best I could anyways in the time that we had. 
Yeah, yeah, we had yeah, it was a good case. It was a hard case, I'll tell you that right now. There's a lot going on in here and it makes it makes me feel sad at this time when all those little girls went missing. Yeah, me too. So just remember everybody, the world is not always as it seems. No, it's not. Okay guys, bye everyone. Bye.